Hey, good people, it's Ron Johnson, and this is the Ron Johnson Show on Locked On Sports Minnesota. Today's show is loaded. It's a beautiful Wednesday, and we got a rookie joining us. New to the Vikings family, Thayer Thomas, wide receiver out of NC State. We have to find out, because free agents, they can go anywhere, but he chose Minnesota. We're going to find out why, coming up next on the Ron Johnson Show. Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. Now the Ron Johnson Show. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. He's played with them, hung out with them, and grown up with all the big names in Minnesota sports. They're hanging out with Ron Johnson. It's the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. And it starts now. Hey everyone, it's Ron Johnson and this is the Ron Johnson Show on Locked On Sports Minnesota. Today's show is loaded. We're going to talk about this undrafted class. We've talked about the draftees. Let's talk about some of these undrafted guys. Myself and Sam Epson, we're going to break that down quickly uh, before our special guest joins us on the Hangover Ron Johnson segment. And that's Thayer Thomas, wide receiver out of NC State. Minnesota Vikings got him shortly after the draft to, to round out their undrafted free agent class to bring in with these group of rookies. They're going to be here next week for rookie minicamp. So looking forward to seeing what Thayer Thomas has to bring to the table. But what is his personality like? Because I think early on you get some fan favorites, and I'm hoping he's one of them. Uh, when you think about this Minnesota Vikings team and, and when you think about what's going on, I want people to remember before we jump into this, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sports book of Locked On Sports Minnesota. Uh, that's go to fanduel.com backslash locked on to get started today. And remember, the Lakers beat the Warriors. I told you guys, those parlays, you're going to want to get on it. So make sure you go to fanduel.com backslash locked on. And so as I bring my uh, producer into the show, Sam Mexham, really quick before we jump into Thayer Thomas. Sam, there's some uh, the, this rookie class, and and one of the names that jumped out to me. We're, we're talking about the undrafted rookies. We've done the drafted rookies. Got a chance to meet Jordan Addison, really good kid. Uh, I, I saw my Vikings.com video pop up with the uh, Detroit player moniker I threw out there with the pink suit, pink bow tie. I saw RG three. Uh, also repeated that, saying that he was fly. Uh, he had the sunglasses on that, that went with it. I joked around and said it reminded me of Soldier Boy a little bit, but it was good to meet Jordan Addison, really good kid. Seems like he has a, a really good head on his shoulders. Uh, I think he's going to be a really good locker room guy. But Sam, when you're talking about these undrafted guys, uh, Ivan Pace out of Cincinnati, and then the 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 other linebacker out of uh, Army, the rush in. Andre Carter. Andre Carter. Those are the two guys that are jumping off the board right now when you're thinking about undrafted defensive guys with Brian Flores' defense. And I heard you and Luke uh, Inman, I think, yesterday talking about uh, Ivan Pace. Uh, what What is it about Ivan Pace that you mm -hmm. think is going to make him special? Well, if you look at his production, Ron, he was more productive than Jack Campbell last year as a linebacker. He and led... I don't like Jack Campbell. I'm just going to be honest. I mean, he, I know he's yeah. a first-round pick. He went to Iowa, so of course, as a Minnesota gopher, I have to hate Iowa. But I like Jack Campbell as a person. I like Jack Campbell as a middle linebacker. I don't like Jack Campbell sideline to sideline. He is not fast enough to me or athletic enough to me to be garnered a first-round linebacker. He is a hard-nosed hitter, mm -hmm. going to you know meet the fullback in the hole. But a lot of people are saying the Lions screwed up. They could have got him in the second <laughs> round. But yeah, what are you saying about it? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you there. But Campbell was taken in the first round. Pace was not drafted, but Pace was more productive. He had more sacks than anyone in college football at the linebacker position. He had more run stops than anyone in college football at the linebacker position. He had more pressures. He was pro football focus's top linebacker. So why was he not drafted, Ron? It's his size, 5'10", 230. 5'10 yeah. is not a very traditional linebacker size. That's like no, seven inches shorter than, than Jack Campbell. So they have to figure out whether he can you know translate to the next level. But the productivity, oh my gosh, you can't argue with it. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and when you think about size, though, I'm going to give you a comparison. Zach Thomas. Zach Thomas was 5'11". Zach Thomas was really productive for the, for the uh, Miami Dolphins. So you could say whatever you want. He played 13 seasons in the NFL. Size doesn't matter. I tell my daughter that because one of my daughters, she's an 8-year-old. She's going to be really tall. The other one is going to probably top out at 5'5". Five, five. Unfortunately, I'm 6'3". Uh, but my, my, my first daughter, I think she's going to get my wife's side of the family's height. Uh, my, my second daughter, she's going to, I mean, because they're both wearing the same size softball pants right now, and there's four to five years in between them. So that just tells you the difference in sizes. 
Mm-hmm. But I told my daughter this. I'm like, it's not about the size of the dog. It's about the size of the fight in the dog. And, and that's where I think Ivan Pace is going to set himself aside. Uh, but again, I go back to Zach Thomas. Zach Thomas was 5'11". And, and people said, oh, he's undersized. One of the best linebackers in NFL history, in my opinion, as far as athleticism, running sideline to sideline. And I think Ivan Pace coming in, special teams, all the other things. And then the Russian uh, Carter from Army. Uh, now that's a freak guy with size. I mean, what do you think about him? Yeah, 6'5", 260. He's kind of got that that lankier, athletic, edge-rushing frame that you look for. He had 15 sacks in 2021 for Army. The reason he didn't get drafted, and a lot of people thought he was a a day-two pick, maybe even day-one pick, Um, he didn't test very well. I think he ran a 4'9", so Mm -hmm. the speed might be an issue. But here's what I'm hanging my hat on, Ron. His agility drills, like the the shuttle and the three cone, and that's not everything. That's just a test. But he was very good in those short areas. So I think that he can still like flash enough athleticism to get the job done. And uh, he's got sort of the frame for it. So I, I think that with a little coaching, uh, that could be a really nice piece that maybe they stash for a year, and then he gets to contribute in 2024. Yeah, and, and when you think about size, he has it. When you think about power, what is he going to be asked to do? Just get after the quarterback. And this 3-4 defense from Brian Flores, it's get after the quarterback. He's going to have other linebackers behind him like Brian Asamoah. Uh, he's going to have to learn from Daniil Hunter. He's going to have Zadarius Smith hopefully uh, still on this team. So when you think about all the pieces they've added, again, that's another guy that I think could become a solid special teams guy. And again, when it comes to the 40 and the test, Terrell Owens didn't run fast. Anquan Bolton didn't run fast. What happened? They were fine. I think sometimes we overthink the 40 yard dash because a lot of guys like I went to the combine. I think I ran. I don't know. You know, I didn't even run at the combine because my hamstring was sore. But then I turned around and and people were questioning what I I ran a four or five. So sometimes people play faster on film than they are. And when I got drafted by the Baltimore Ravens, that's one thing that they realized. Like I'm six, three, 230 pounds. I'm not going to run fast. But am I going to block? Am I going to be bigger than every other DB I face? Yeah. And I think that was the key. I think that was the same when I went to the Bears and became a tight end. That was the key. So it's 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 about more you can do. And I think this is a kid that's going to be a more you can do kid. You know, he went to Army again. Very, you're talking about a guy that's structured, diligent, going to be on time in the meetings, going to be in front, going to have his notebook nice and crisp, going to have his shirt looking good. Like, that's a kid. Between him and Jaron Hall, I don't know who, is, uh, who has higher character. Like, this is probably <laughs> one of the highest character drafts I've seen when you're talking about guys in your locker room that you can count on, that when you turn on ESPN at 2 in the morning, you're not going to have to worry, or 6 in the morning, you're not going to have to worry about, like, so-and-so was pulled over at 2 a.m. I remember Tony Dungy, when I coached with the coach for those two years, that's the one thing Tony Dungy would preach to these guys and Jim Caldwell. You do not want to be caught on ESPN after midnight. I promise you, you won't want to be caught because you will not be here. And Tony Dungy always stuck to that and that's why those guys always i mean guys like reggie wayne i mean we had uh uh, roy hall on the show that talked about when i was coaching uh i mean those guys said it like this is cato june same thing those are these are lessons with the coach that have not changed and i think you're bringing in two high character guys to the vikings and jaron hall and uh andre carter from uh from army i mean that's 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 the highest character you can get but Speaking of undrafted guys i know we were going to talk about nose the receiver we'll have to get to him maybe on the friday uh round table but like I said, 6'3", big receiver. Uh, is he out of T- TCU, right? K-State. K-State. I know it's purple. Um, but out of <laughs> K-State, yeah, I know you talked about you liked him. I said that the first time, too. I like his size, um, his ability in traffic. Not a, a not a like a, a super polished receiver. Um, and that's what happens sometimes and holds guys back is when you don't have like that, that cut-up tape that's like route after route after route, thousand-yard seasons. It's tough to get drafted when you look at all the other pieces of the puzzle. I was the ninth receiver taken in the NFL draft, and I'm old, uh, in 2002. And so of the ninth receiver, if you look at that now, it, you never know where you're going to go because it depends on how many go in the first, how many go in the second, how many go in the third. Like, it it all depends. You know, you could be a top ten receiver, but it's all about the other positions. And I think, you know, guys like Knowles, like Thayer Thomas, and, and speaking of Thayer Thomas, we got Thayer Thomas going to join us on the Hang on Ron Johnson segment coming up next. And remember, people, Amazon Fire and Roku, great partners. Please go to Amazon Fire or your Roku device to search Locked On Sports Minnesota. You can download all of our videos, all of our shows. We have a word from our sponsors. It's a built bar day on Locked On Sports Minnesota. Let me tell you about the most delicious tasting protein bar in the world. It's built bar, 100% real dark chocolate which is so delicious, and you pair that with peanut butter brownie flavors, cookies and cream, brownie batter puff, so good. It's healthy and tasty. Why is it healthy? Only four grams of sugar. 
but they're packing 17 grams of protein into these built bars and they are accessible at your nearest Walmart or Sam's Club. Walk on down to the pharmacy section, pick up a four bar box, a 13 bar box, or conveniently head to built.com and order online. Built Bar, the most delicious tasting protein bar in the world. Get a snack that's healthy and still tastes amazing. Well, as promised, it's time for the Hanging with Ron Johnson segment, and I got a special guest there, Thomas, wide receiver at NC State. And the more I'm reading about this guy, man, the more I realize this kid has crossed so many paths, and so I think this was just destined. You know, I, I think in, in life, things are destined to happen. He was coached by Joker Phillips, uh, former my former wide receiver coach at the University of Minnesota, and he also was coached by George McDonald. For those Minnesota fans, I don't know if you remember, but Tim Brewster, we, we try to ignore the Tim Brewster era, but George McDonald was a really good coach within the Tim Brewster era. Uh, and so he was also at NC State. And so as I bring Thayer Thomas into the show, man, appreciate you for joining me today on the Ron Johnson Show. Uh, I want to jump out there. Early question, man. Uh, as a free agent, you're going through this process of the draft. And I was there. Like, as, like I said, I was the 10th receiver taken or ninth receiver taken uh, in the draft. And so a lot of times if you have four first rounders, four second rounders, third round or second round could be where you're at. It, you never know. Uh, and so in my process, it was frustrating sitting there waiting for that phone call. Finally got the call from the Ravens and a uh, little bit of excitement, but also a little bit of pissed offness. Uh, I saw Joy Porter Jr., his dad, you know, I played, with, played against Joy Porter Sr. And I saw him talk about that too to his son, like, you know, take this chip on your shoulder and take it into camp. But when you think about this draft process, man, first, what was going through your head as you, you know, saw the draft going and, and you knew your name wasn't going to be called? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, you know, going into day three, I knew there was a chance that I could maybe go late. Um, and, you know, once that didn't happen, I just kind of had to turn my mindset quickly um, into, you know, what's the best fit for me? Because at the end of the day, my biggest dream and goal is to make the 53-man roster. And I just needed to find a place where I felt like I fit in. I had a shot to make the team and, uh, you know, good culture, good coaching staff. And, a really a staff and a uh, you know organization that really saw uh, you know a future for me, and so that's kind of what I saw with the Vikings, um, and it made it pretty easy for me. Yeah, and when you say culture, because I know that's a big term here. I mean, I'm pretty sure you know the whole roll the boat culture. Uh, you see the the, the aura behind me from PJ Fleck, uh, and culture is huge. Uh, I think in all college sports, I think in even just work related stuff, culture is a big deal. So when you talk about Kevin O'Connell and his culture, what about the Minnesota Vikings culture really made you feel like, you know what, I, I want to be there? Yeah, I mean, I, so I know two guys on the team, uh, Garrett Bradbury, I played with. In oh, yeah. um, and he happened to be back for the spring game a, a few weeks ago. And he just was like speaking highly of the organization and what he feels like this staff has really done in one year. Um, and it's funny cause I hadn't really talked to him since he had left. It's been probably four years and it was very coincidental that we had this conversation before the draft. And then I, I, I'm, I'm really good friends with Blake Prohl and I just seen his oh, process, yeah. um, and see kind of seen how, um, you know, he's been able to work and develop and, um, he's, he's spoken very highly of, uh, you know, Minnesota in general. So, um, those two guys that I know very, you know, pretty well. And, uh, I kind of use that along with some conversations that I had. Um, with you know people on staff to kind of make my decision yeah and when you think about that man like you get two usc guys in the in the, in the draft you get two lsu guys in the draft uh and now we have garrett bradbury already here you're coming here so it, it is kind of a thing to like you're walking into a situation where you're not going in blind like you do know some people on the team so playing with garrett bradbury though what do you remember most about playing with garrett bradbury yeah, uh, he was a great leader because I was a freshman and I actually played a decent amount as a freshman. Um, mm. He was that, you know, senior center that was going to be a first round draft pick. And so the one thing I remember, you know, early on, like before I started making plays, like that was one guy that kind of just treated everybody the same. Um, and regardless of where you sort of were on the totem pole. And um, he was just a really good uh, leader, a really good guy. Um, and I love the way he plays the game, you know, really plays really hard, plays really tough. Um, and he was kind of like me out of, in, in college. Like he came in as a tight end, very low recruited guy. Um, and I, I, he might have been a two star, three star. I don't know what he was, but, you know, I, I, I walked on at NC State. And so we were kind of in the same position as far as where we started at NC State. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of both worked our way up to where we were at the end by the end of our career. So I can relate to him in that aspect of things. But, yeah, he's a great guy. And when you think about, because uh, you 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 said um, Garrett Bradbury was a tight end, I I forgot about that. 
Because I can't imagine him catching now. Like, he doesn't look like he can catch anymore. But when you think about Garrett Bradbury uh, and his situation, playing tight end, and then you being a walk-on, when when did you – like, at what point did you earn your scholarship and what was that experience like? Because I know I see now on social media, coaches do all these cool ways to give kids scholarship, you know, let them know their own scholarship now. What was your experience like? So I got there in June of 2017, and uh, I, I went through summer workouts right before fall camp, and – you know, we have guys like, you know, Bradley Chubb, Jermaine Pratt, um, B.J. Hill, you know, Ryan Finley at quarterback, Jalen Samuels, like Jacoby Myers, you know, is in the slot with me. Y'all are and, some dogs. I forgot about all those guys, man. And I'm, and I'm a freshman, and I'm kind of just soaking everything up and kind of learning and just trying to find my, my role within the team. And I knew I had to put on some weight. I probably weighed 170 um, when I got to college. So I knew that first year was going to be about my development. So I really took, you know, practice very seriously when I got on the field and there was one time with my first practice, you know, Naheem was very encouraging of me just because he was from Raleigh. And so, um, you know, he was like, come catch punts. And that's an easy way to find your you know, way onto the field early. And obviously I didn't think I was going to play that year, but my, by him telling me that and kind of just getting me to go back there and start catching punts with these future NFL guys, um, I created, a, you know, the ability to do so. So that next year um, going into spring ball, Coach Doran, our head coach, was like, we, you know, we just lost Naheem and we need to find a new punt returner. Which I want, I kind of want you to be that guy. So then uh, I, I won scout team, you know, was one of the better scout team players that year. And I was got a lot of recognition for it in that fall when I redshirted. And then that spring, I was second in catches on the team for spring ball. And so um, that was a big jump for me. I was in the two deep. And going into summer, Coach Doran gave me a scholarship. He came to my house and gave me a scholarship in – you know, I got it within nine months of being there. So Man. he was, uh, you know, he was like, you're the only player I've given a scholarship to without stepping foot on the field in the game. And the other guy was uh, J.J. Watt. So uh, you, got, <laughs> you got some big shoes to fill in. So, Man, that's a cool moment because, uh, you know, I, I know for parents even, that's probably a better moment for your parents realizing, OK, we don't have to pay for your school anymore. Because uh, as a parent, I know that's I'm like, man, I don't I don't want to spend any more money on my kids than I have to. Uh, but looking at your stats, man, like you, you amassed some really high stats. You got 215 catches, 2400 yards, 24 touchdowns. Uh, but when you talk about Thayer Thomas, the wide receiver, you know, because I know Jordan or Jordan. Uh, Joker Phillips always talks about like, what are you good at? What are you better at? You know, balance, knees over toes or chest over knees, knees over toes, you know, all this stuff. Like everybody has something they're good at. Are you an in traffic receiver? Are you a fade receiver in the red zone? Uh, what does Thayer Thomas do well in, in, you know, what makes you or sets you aside from other receivers? I think my ability to get open, um, you know, when, when it's crunch time and like I need to be able to create separation with my defender, I think I have a really good bag of routes and different techniques that I use a lot of different releases. Um, and that just goes, you know, I, I over the last five years, I, I take practice very seriously. So the one-on-ones that I do in practice, I try to see what works, what doesn't work. So when I get in the game and it gets in a game time situation, I kind of know what I'm going to do and I have a plan. But then when that plan doesn't work, I feel like I do a really good job of, uh, you know, kind of thinking on the fly and making up for, you know, things that might not work. So just reacting off of that. Um, and just my consistency in my hands, like I feel like my ability to catch the football and uh, make contested catches as well as, you know, my strengths. And when the Minnesota Vikings called you, because I'm pretty sure other teams called your agent as well. And, and you know, you had to kind of make a decision. Uh, what were some of the things they told you, you know, the reason why they wanted you or this is this would be a good place for you? Yeah, they just saw um, first and foremost, they, they saw a uh, future within the offense. Like a lot of teams, you know, were calling and said we could see you as a punt returner, this and that. But you know, this team kind of saw both futures as far as a role in the offense, possibly if I do my thing, and then possibly role, you know, in special teams. And so um, having those talks, it kind of made sense um, that, you know, obviously if I have a, you know, a vision, if they have a vision for me offensively and then along with special teams, I think it kind of makes sense because that could, you know, I could help the team in multiple ways. So I just felt like that um, was a – you know, a great factor in why I decided to go with the Vikings. Yeah. How much have you watched Cooper cup play? Cause I mean, honestly, like that's when I see Thayer Thomas and I, and I watch NC state stuff, you I feel like it's a little bit of Cooper cup ish, like in the slot, you know, being able to move around shifty with the routes. Like how, how much time have you spent watching some NFL receivers like that to say, this is who I want to mirror my game off of, of who is another guy you might mirror your game off of. Yeah, I mean, he's great, you know, just watching his route running ability, you know. Um, I watch him a lot, 
you know, I kind of watch, um, you know, how the Rams utilize him. I feel like, you know, if I'm in a, in a if I'm in a system that can utilize me in a way um, that, you know, he was utilized in some way, in some form in uh, L.A. And just like I think it's a lot of it has to do with putting your players in the right positions to make uh, certain plays. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, that's proven with Coach O'Connell. He was, you know, a part of that with um, Cooper Cup and they won a Super Bowl doing that. So. Um, that's kind of the vision I've had um, and just, you know, I think he saw that in me as well. So I just kind of, um, you know, it really jumped out at me. It was very intriguing to like to see that um, and, and hear that. Yeah. When you think about this team too, you're, you're walking into a room. I played against Keenan McCardell uh, and now he's the coach of the Minnesota Vikings. I've had a chance to hang out with him a couple of times as well uh, at some events, really good guy down to earth, knows his stuff. But when you found out, and not found out, kind of major decision knowing Keenan McCardell was going to be your coach, uh, what, what are you looking forward to the most of learning from Keenan McCardell? Yeah, I think some of the best coaches are guys who have been there and done that, and he's definitely one of those guys. Um, he's been in the battle. He's been in the heat of the game. And, you know, he played for a long time in the league. And so, obviously, he's, you know, very knowledgeable on how to play the receiver position. So I'm really just looking forward to picking his brain and, you know, kind of finding ways to stick and, um, just make it in this league, and I feel like he could help me do that. And um, my my high school receiver coach was Tory Holt, so he, oh man, he, he gave me a call when I decided, um, and was just spoke very highly of him as well. So um, it was good to hear that. And when you think about what you said, when you talk about Keenan McCardell, you talk about these great receivers, but you're walking into a building with the best receiver in the NFL and Justin Jefferson. Uh, you're going to be in the same locker room, same meeting room as Justin Jefferson. First, before we get into the Justin Jefferson, have you grittied? Like, can you gritty? Like, have you have you done that? I have. Um, <laughs> I've gotten better over the last two years, three years since he kind of put that on um, um, blast. And, you know, that's kind of been a thing that I've tried to get better at in case <laughs> I do make it to the NFL. I can do that. But it's kind of funny how – I'm now on his team, so. Uh, like, are you bet? Like, would you say you're better I'm than better. like I've than Mike Jacecki, like Adam Thielen? No, I've seen them do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm better than them. Because I, I mean, because I've seen uh, who else did it? T.J. Hawkinson tried to do it. Um, uh, Chris Boyd, he was here. DB, he was okay. Like, there's not a lot of guys that have the Jamar Chase, the Joe Burrow, uh, the Justin Jefferson. I, and I don't know if it's maybe because they all went to LSU and they've done it, uh, but they just do it smooth. So yeah. I, good to know that you're better than them because I know. Uh, that's the one thing that I'm pretty sure uh, preseason, you know, your first touchdown, people are going to be trying to see, like, is he going to do the gritty or not? Because that's that's become a thing here in Minnesota. Uh, Justin Jefferson made it worldwide, worldwide. But when you think about Justin Jefferson and just his impact on the game of football, uh, when you found out he was going to be your teammate, what was that thought like? Yeah, he's probably the best receiver in the NFL. And uh, just the way he's able to bend and maneuver, he's, he's special. Like, not many guys can move the way he does. And so – you know, I'm just really looking forward to just, you know, getting to know him, kind of picking his brain and just kind of, you know, I, I'm a guy that likes to take things from people and kind of put it in my own bag. And so uh, just to see him in practice every day is going to be a blessing just so I can see how he, he works and how he practices and how he does certain things so I can help it um, to my advantage. So, And we when you talk about college football, like for me, um, I played against Wisconsin. We won the Axe my senior year. Um, you know, I remember bowl games, even fun stuff, because I had Joey Harrington on the show. I don't know if you remember Joey Harrington, former uh, Oregon Duck quarterback, uh, Heisman Trophy candidate. I don't know if he won or, you know, I think he was a candidate that year. I don't think he won. Uh, I think Eric Crouch actually might have won our senior year. Um, but when you look at Joey Harrington, you know, playing Oregon in a bowl game, like I remember, you know, being down there, like there, and Joker Phillips, like I joked about that. Joker Phillips, we made jokes about his suit because he forgot to wear his socks. And so his ankles were ashy the entire bank banquet uh for the bowl game so all kinds of memories like that uh were some of my best but beating penn state penn state was second in the country we beat them ohio state was fifth in the country or sixth in the country we beat them at, on their homecoming uh so things like that were some of my favorite moments what are some moments for you or a moment for you that you're like man like that's that's gonna stick with me you know my entire life yeah i have a few you know in 2021 we were uh we beat clemson at home they were top five team man. um and i scored a touchdown in overtime um, and we had won the game and uh, that was a big moment, you know, beating UNC twice kind of in the last seconds. Uh, you know, we were down nine with 120 left and we ended up winning the game. We scored, you know, kicked an onside kick and then scored again with very little time left on the clock. Um, and then there was one time in 2021 where, um, you know, I had about, you know, 90 yards receiving in a touchdown and my brother had a pick six that game. So we both scored. Um, in that same game and I'll always remember that for sure 
Yeah, man, because it's it's one of those things that, you know, college football, I tell people this all the time, like never let anybody denigrate what you've done because yeah. what you do is going to happen. But what you've done can't be taken away from you. And uh, it's, it's it's also like, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Five Heartbeats. I know Sam hasn't because my producer, he doesn't watch a lot of movies. But the Five Heartbeats, I remember like that was one of the scenes that he's like, they can't take who we were. They can never take who we were, which is true. You cannot take what we've done uh, as an organization, as a person, whatever. But what we do is what's going to happen. What we've done, it's in history. Um, but looking at Joker Phillips. No, what were you going to yeah. say? I was going to say there was one more. So this year we played at Death Valley, Clemson. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, we were, I think, rated. We were nine and Clemson was three. And it was a college game day. So I was able to play like a college game day, like the main game of that Saturday, um, which was pretty cool. And it was like. We were undefeated. They were undefeated. We lost by 10, but, you know, just being the leading receiver in that game and just kind of being in that atmosphere under the lights was definitely something I'll always remember as well. So, yeah, no, college game day seems, I mean, I've been to it. Um, I've been on the stage with Desmond Howard and those guys when they came to Minnesota for Wisconsin because we didn't have that when I was growing up. Like, it wasn't a thing in college when I played. So, it, I've heard it's a ridiculous from a player's perspective and just all the media, all the fans, uh, everybody shows up for it. So, yeah, that's definitely uh, one to always remember. Um, what we got two more before we get out of here. We jump over to uh last minute closeout daily three with myself and Sam Ekstrom. Uh, but when you think about uh Joker Phillips as a coach, um, and and I always had coaches like you know, I've had Brian Billick as a coach with the Ravens, I had Tony Dungy, um, I've had uh, uh, um, ah. Uh, Lovey Smith with the Bears. And so I, I've taken different things, but I know Joker, some of the things he's always taught me and told me stuck with me. Uh, what are some things you've learned from George McDonald and uh, Joker Phillips that you're going to take with you into the NFL? Yeah, Coach McDonald kind of gave me the blueprint when I was a freshman on, you know, how to be successful. I mean, he kind of always preached like working hard doesn't guarantee success, but it, it definitely helps your odds and it, it puts the odds in your favor. And Something he always, you know, he was a big preacher about catching jugs, like 200, 300 jugs a day. And I still use that, you know, to this day. I still go and catch about 200, 300 jugs a day. Just it gives you confidence as a receiver. If you're always constantly catching the ball, then it's, it becomes second nature. And that's something that I, you know, will continue to do as long as I'm playing. Um, with Coach um, Joke, um, you know, he he's a guy that, you know, I feel like he really helped me later in my career because I got him with only two years remaining in my career. Um, and it was a lot different of approach. You know, he, he really saw the game of football and was like, you guys, it's a, it's a game for a reason. Like, don't go out there and, like, you know, be nervous. And he's like, it's a game created by PE teachers, and that's something mm -hmm. that I'll always remember. Because he kind of he, – he allowed me to play really, uh, you know, very freely, and, you know, he had the utmost, the utmost confidence in me to go out there and make plays. And um, he, he also taught me a lot about different, you know, defenses <clears throat> and kind of learning how – if you know what the, you know, the defense is going to do, it makes, you know, your route running and also your blocking assignments a lot easier. So um, that's kind of what I, you know, what he helped me a lot with. Yeah. And that's the one thing I'll say when you get to mini camp, when you get to training camp, do every special teams they ask you to do. If you want to, I mean, I would tell the coach, cause they're going to ask, I want to be on punt. I want to be on punt block. I want to be on punt return. I want to be on kickoff, kickoff return. Like, every single one i want to i want to be the returner but i also can be a a, a gunner like everything because that's going to be the key too is like the more you can do because like you said when he comes out of the 53 they're gonna have to find nine guys that can do more than one thing nine guys there's there's only one kirk cousins there's only one justin jefferson there's only one harrison smith but they got to find at least nine other guys and and that's where you come in uh to do other stuff and so i would tell you you know Every special team is possible. Go to the meetings. Every you know, the special teams coach be in his ear all the time during practice. Make sure you're always you know in the front of the drill, working the hardest. Uh, that's Thayer Thomas, uh, wide receiver from NC State, now a Minnesota Viking. Last one before we get out of here, Thayer. What is something that you want the Minnesota Viking fans to know about you, uh, and what can they look forward to when you step on the field? Yeah. Um... You know, I'm, you know, very hard worker and, you know, I've kind of uh, whatever I put my mind to in my life, I've seemed to obtain it. So, you know, I, I I'm going to give it my all. And, um, you know, throughout my whole career, I've always kind of been the underdog and I, I'm very comfortable in those positions. So, um, you know, I'm just looking forward to making plays like I've done for a while here. And I just, you know, looking forward to the opportunity um, to get up to Minnesota. And last one, I actually was seeing this last year, so I have to ask you this, too. When you see Minnesota, I mean, there's snow, there's all this other stuff. 
Uh, but when, when you hear about the Minnesota, you got the Mall of America, you know, you got all these things in Minnesota, you got Valley Fair, which is kind of like Cedar Point or kind of like Disney World, but really low version of it. What are you looking forward to the most about Minneapolis? Because you guys are going to have days off to just go to the mall or, you know, relax or go to a lake. What are you looking forward to the most when you get to Minnesota? Yeah, I think, you know, going to the Mall of America is something that I've always, uh, you know, I've heard of it a lot as a kid. <laughs> kind of like that's the biggest mall ever. Um, so I definitely got to go check that place out. Um, I've heard the food is really good. It doesn't matter what you're eating. It kind of they ha it varies and, it's, you know, a lot of great food there. And then the last thing I've, I've heard I need to do is go check a Twins game out um, oh. in uh, downtown. So <clears throat> that's something I'll probably end up doing in summer. And this is a good year to check the Twins out because they're doing a lot better. The pitch count is helping them. This is the first time ever they've beaten the Yankees this much early on in the season. So, yeah, this is a good year to check the Twins out. I'm Ron Johnson. That's Thayer Thomas. This was the Hanging with Ron Johnson segment. To Thayer, I appreciate you for joining me, man. And I can't wait to meet you when you get up here in Minneapolis. Yes, sir. Appreciate you having me on the show. I'm looking forward to getting up there. Well, that was Thayer Thomas, wide receiver from NC State, now a Minnesota Vikings free agent receiver who's going to come in. He's got to work cut out for him, but I am pulling for this kid because I honestly truly believe when you look at the Rams offense, and I think he truly is a piece that can be in the slot. He can be a blocker. Like he said, he's had some great receivers coaches. So this guy, I feel like mentally is pro ready. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing Thayer Thomas compete. We already know about Mike Knowles out of Kansas State. So it's going to be a it's going to be a fun battle. They have some really good DBs, Byron Murphy Jr., Caleb Evans, that they're going to go against. Uh, so this is going to be a fun training camp, people. So this is one you're going to want to check out. I'm excited about this year. Uh, and remember, you can now uh, shoot three, two, one. And remember. Locked On Sports Minnesota is a proud partner with CARE 11. Just check out care11.com backslash locked on to get links to every one of our locked on shows. And we have a word from our sponsors. Thanks, Ron. Uh, it's still not too late to get subscribe to lockedonpodcast.com slash newsletters for all the NFL draft reaction. Get some draft intel straight to your inbox. Well, now it's time for the daily three. That's three questions, three minutes each. Take it away, Sam. All right, hockey question for you, Ron. So Bill Guerin did his season-ending press conference yesterday, mm -hmm. and he was adamant, Ron, kind of like Giannis after the Bucks lost. He was adamant that the season was not a failure, despite mm -hmm. the Wild losing in six games in the first round. What do you think of that mindset? Well, I'm a debate champ. So I can debate, like, you give me any side of the debate, I can take it. You can give me the positive side of this. So the positive side is, it is true. You cannot look at, like, failure is growth. And so that's what PJ Fleck always says. Failure is not truly failure, it's growth. And so I understand what he's saying. Like, this is not a failure. This is just an opportunity for us to grow, learn. What do we do wrong? What, what can we get better at? How can we improve the next year? So some people look at failure as, I'm going to fall and stay down. Some people say failure is fall and get up. Whichever way you look at it, I think he's trying to look at the glass is half full, not the glass is half empty, because so many negative people try to take that route. Um, the other side of it is you can't say it's a failure. Like you could say we were supposed to beat the stars. We that was supposed to be our game. We were supposed to have that series, and we were supposed, and then we would have got the Seattle Kraken, like you said, Sam, and they would have had the home ice advantage over the Seattle Kraken. Who knows where that goes? Maybe they beat the Seattle Kraken, and then from there, I mean steps away from the from from the cup so some people can look at it that way and say man you didn't even have to play the avalanche if you had won the series uh I, I i think it's a failure but i get where he's saying so i think the mindset is fine you don't want to go into the mindset with a negative uh off season like the grizzlies the grizzlies have a total negative off season at this point like they told mm -hmm. dylan brooks at no circumstance ever there's no way ever ever like there's like you could at least leave the door open a little bit like we're not interested in dylan brooks right now but maybe they didn't even at no circumstance are we – so that's a negative way to leave the season. I think same with uh, G G uh, Giannis, uh, the Greek freak. He's trying to say – Antetokounmpo, because I can't say it. Uh, he's trying to say, yeah, there's not a failure, man. Michael Jordan didn't make it every year with those failure years, um, and nobody would say Jordan failed. Jordan, They would say Jordan was learning. Jordan was getting better. He was learning how to beat the Pistons. So I think that's what Bill Guerin's trying to put into his team's head. We're just learning, and we're trying to find a way to get better and, and beat the Stars or beat the Avalanche, whoever we have to face next year in the playoffs. I don't know, Sam. What do you think? Yeah, it, it is ultimately – it's all semantics. You know, if you want to frame it that way, you can frame it that way. That's fine. Um, you know, I think Bill Guerin still holds his team to pretty high expectations. I don't think he's okay with this result. This is just how he's presenting it to the media. Mm -hmm. It's very frustrating 
and he acknowledged that as well, that fans have now seen them miss the second round seven playoff appearances in a row. Um, so failure, not failure. I guess it just depends how hard nosed you want to be about it. Um, I think the Wild still have produced very entertaining regular seasons. They're still they played very good hockey. And um ultimately, if you keep doing that, you're gonna put yourself in good positions. So I'm I'm okay with his approach. What you got next? Yeah, I got a Wolves question. Nas Reed is probably their premier free agent this year. Mm-hmm. Um, on a scale of one to ten, Ron. How important is it for the Wolves to agree to a contract with Nas Reed and bring him back in free agency? I'm never going to say 10 because in sports, I think there's always somebody else that could help. I mean, unless you're talking about, like, again, like a guy like Aaron Rodgers uh, or a guy like Tom Brady, you know, stuff like that. Those are 10s. Uh, for Nas Reed, though, I do think it's important. I would say eight. I think it's important because the problem is you lost so many pieces uh, to trying to get Rudy Gobert. So you don't have a lot of draft capital over the next couple of years. So you do want to try to keep a nucleus together. You can see without him how they struggled against a team like the Nuggets, uh, where the Nuggets are actually really good. I mean, they're killing the Suns right now. Uh, but I do think it's very important uh, that they sign Najri. One, uh, you do, like, what, what does this team look like? Because if you do move on from Rudy Gobert, you definitely need to have Nas Reed. Uh, but that's what everybody talked about. Because you, when 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 Gobert was out or when Cat was out, they were hoping Nas Reed would be the extra guy. Nas Reed could have been the guy to deal with the Joker because I think he's a little bit more athletic uh, than uh, Gobert. And then he won't get into foul trouble. And if he does, you don't care like Cat because you can't put Cat on him all the time because he gets in foul trouble. You can't put Gobert on him because he can't handle Jokic. Like you, he just can't. And so I think Nas Reed would have been a better option there to kind of bully him, push him a little bit, um, because that's what you're seeing with the Suns. DeAndre Ayton is not, like, he's nowhere to be found. Like, he's not stopping him. He's not trying to intervene. He's not trying to bully him. He's seven feet, and he's letting this guy just walk him down the court like a like a, like a a little kid. And so that's where I think, that's why I think Nasri is important, because he does add that, that, that bully factor to the team. He does add that ability to get rebounds. He does the dirty work. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's important. You want to keep your nucleus together as, as much as possible because clearly it's a playoff team. But what pieces do you need to add and maybe what pieces do you need to get rid of to make this a five, you know, five or six seed team? I don't know. What are your thoughts, Sam? Yeah, it does feel like it's about a seven or an eight on the priority list. And the question is, does Nas want to come back to Minnesota knowing that he might not be a starter? He might continue to be kind of be in the shadow of Rudy Gobert and Cat for as long as he signs that deal. Um, I don't know if he's going to get a starting role anywhere, so he may end up realizing that Minnesota is the best place for him. But right. how fun was he to watch, Ron, down the stretch? Just his ability to to kind of spin move on anybody in the paint and get his shot. Uh, that's something that Cat doesn't have. That's something that Gobert doesn't have. So that's a special player. Uh, I think they got to bring him back. Yeah. Last, last one. one. Lakers Warriors, Ron. I know yes. you're dialed into the NBA playoffs right now. Lakers knock off the Warriors on yes. the road in game one. Are the Lakers becoming title contenders? They've been title contenders. There's the thing. They won a championship with LeBron and AD already. So they've been contenders. The problem is health. AD is one touch away from going off the court and being done for the rest of the series. So that's why every time I see him jump and everybody's underneath him, every time I see him get bumped and he kind of, you know, grimaces, you know, he said, I can't feel my arm. I'm like, Oh Lord, here we go. Like he is one touch from one touch is all it takes possibilities. AD is never, I mean, it's, it's so bad of how scary, like every time he goes down, you can hear the, everybody in LA just go, <gasps> And then he gets back up because that's the key. If LeBron is healthy, if AD is healthy, if D'Lo is healthy, Austin Reeves is ridiculous. Like he's becoming a really good player, a really good score when they need him. This team is tough to beat. And at the seven C, you got the seven versus the five. I don't think anybody would have picked the seven versus the five uh, one step away from the Western Conference Finals. You might have a seven. You could have had seven versus four, but now you might have a seven versus one. And I'm honestly taking the Lakers over the Nuggets. Like, I think the Lakers are contenders. Like, I just think D'Lo was that piece they needed to give them some, like, hot buckets every once in a while. Um, Questionable defense, but hot buckets every once in a while. And then also, if you think about where they are with Austin Reeves, whenever LeBron is down, Austin Reeves is not scared of the moment. He's not scared. I mean, the fact that he's willing to yell, I am him. Like, he's willing to take the the big shot when it's needed. Um, And the Warriors... This is a spot I don't know if they thought they would be in. They'd be down early. If they lose this second one and they have to go back to L.A. for two, 
and they get and they don't win both in LA and they you know it goes three to one. I don't know if they have LeBron did that to Steph. Now this could be a reverse Steph LeBron where LeBron came made Steph come back three to or no came back on Steph three to one. Maybe this is the way the 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 script writers wanted to happen. Like because we're in a movie, we're in a simulation. Now let's reverse the roles. LeBron's up three one on Steph and Steph comes back and wins it four to three. I don't know if the Warriors have that though because they all can shoot the ball and it's like who takes it? Jordan Poole was hot. Clay can shoot. Steph, we know, is ridiculous. But the Lakers are doing what you have to do, which is stop Steph. Double team Steph. Force somebody else to beat you. And that's all it took. Steph was was kind of cold early on in the game. He had like one or two shots in the third quarter. He did start getting going in the fourth. And that's just from being tired. Everybody else was tired of chasing him around because he never stopped running. But the Lakers are doing what most teams are scared to do, which is let's leave some of these other guys open like Wiggins and whatever. But I also like this and before I give it to you. Andrew Wiggins versus LeBron is kind of funny because I would have never thought Andrew Wiggins could hold his own against LeBron, but he's scoring on him. He's going at him. He's playing defense. Like, I don't know where that Wiggins was in Minnesota. Maybe Steph Curry unlocked something that 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 nobody else in Minnesota could do for him because Steph and Clay have unlocked Andrew Wiggins. Like, he is out there playing with against LeBron, Like, and you don't even notice that it's Andrew versus LeBron. It's just like these are two ballers going at it. But, yeah, no, I'm excited about this. I think the Lakers for sure contenders, though. What do you think? Yeah, I think the Warriors were exhausted. I mean, I think that Kings series was so emotional and so hard fought that this yeah. was this was not a surprise to me that they would have a letdown in game one. I think the Warriors are going to win this series, but it might take them seven games again. Um, and I don't know if they can keep doing this. Like, I, I don't know if they are young enough and, and spry enough to keep battling for seven games every series. What What it makes me think is, I think the Nuggets are going to the NBA Finals. Yeah. I think the Nuggets are just going to have an easier path to get there, and they're going to get an exhausted Warriors team in the Western Finals, and the Nuggets are going to the Finals. That's my take. Yeah, that is true. Like, the Nuggets, I just don't I don't want the Nuggets to go. I don't know. They're so boring. I don't want to see the Nuggets versus, like, the 76ers. Like, I, I, I don't. Yeah. Um. I, I would rather, like, and, and again, the Heat, the Heat is one-to-one, but the Heat have a chance. Like, I would love to see an eight-versus-seven NBA Finals. Like, that would be, like, Po po poetic for all the haters out there. Like everybody was picking like the Bucks and all. Heat versus Lakers. The odds makers would have no idea what to do, but then that would be the Lakers championship because I don't think the Heat can beat the Lakers the way the Lakers are created. Um, Jimmy Butler's out with an ankle injury, so who knows how long he's going to be out. Um, I, I de- but the but the Heat without Jimmy Butler still almost beat the Knicks. That's what's crazy about that team. Uh, I don't know what Eric Spoelstra's doing, but he's got them moving on all cylinders. Uh, but that was a great show today, man. Th- uh, thanks for joining me, Sam. Uh, Thayer Thomas, he was great. Like I, I loved him. I learned a lot about him. I'm looking forward to you know I always pick a favorite. And I, you know, he's odds on early favorite, especially from the locked on family, uh, to, to, to see how it's going. We'll have to get him after his first mini camp, maybe get him back on the show, see how that went, uh, see what he's learned. And then of course during training camp, maybe we can get him a couple of times. Uh, but I want everybody to remember locked on sports, Minnesota. If you want endless Vikings talk, make sure you subscribe. You have to go to YouTube, have an email address and subscribe to locked on sports, Minnesota's YouTube channel. Just hit the follow button. Also, wherever you get your podcast, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartMedia app for free, wherever you get them, just search locked on sports, Minnesota. Hit the follow button there as well. You'll get all the updates, all of our shows. I want to thank you. Enjoy this beautiful, sunny day.